Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Tommy Lynn Sells. Tommy Lynn Sells was an American serial killer who is responsible for 22 confirmed deaths, but authorities have said that they know there are more. I actually watched an interview that he did, and one of the aspects that scared me the most while watching him talk about his crimes is how you can tell that he committed these acts because he wanted to, and because he liked it. In the end, Tommy was caught because of someone who survived his attack in the most incredible way. She was able to go on and give such a good description of him that it led to his capture and she was able to positively identify him. Not only did she save her own life, but who knows how many others. In the end, Tommy and his crimes were deemed so horrific that he received the death sentence and was executed on April 3rd, 2014. In our number nine spot today, we have Sam Little. Sam Little is well known for being one of the worst serial killers ever. He has confessed to taking the lives of more than 90 people, and while authorities have only been able to definitively connect him to 30, they say they have no reason to doubt the validity of any of his other confessions. Sam was able to continue on his horrible path for so many years because of the fact that he committed these crimes in different states and different counties, which made it more difficult to connect these crimes to one another. In an interview with an investigator named Sergeant LeBlanc, as they discussed religious beliefs, they spoke about the nature of sin. Sam stated he had no fear of God and said that God made him this way, so why should he ask for forgiveness? He said that God knew everything he did. He also allegedly told a few select people that he believed he was the devil. In our number eight spot today, we have Vincenzo Verzeni. Vincenzo lived from 1849 to 1918, and he was a serial killer who was nicknamed the Vampire of Bergamo. The first of his victims was found in 1870, and when authorities examined the body, they found bite marks on the neck, as well as certain parts of the body missing. The next of his victims, he didn't end up taking the life of, but he tried to bite their neck. In 1872, there was the next body of one of his victims that was found, and it had all the strange and disturbing signs that the previous one had. After Vincenzo was arrested, he confessed to his crimes with the added detail that he also chose to drink the blood of his victims before leaving their bodies. Somehow, Vincenzo managed to escape the death penalty after a vote of sympathy from only one juror, and he instead was sentenced to life in an asylum. In our number seven spot today, we have Daria Saltikova. Daria was a Russian noblewoman and serial killer from Moscow. She became well known for killing many of her serfs, mostly women. Because of her ties to the Russian royal court and other Russian nobility, complaints about the deaths at her estate were initially ignored and only resulted in punishments for those who did the complaining. Eventually, however, relatives of those who had been killed were able to bring a petition to Empress Catherine II, who then decided to try Daria publicly. Investigations took six long years where the investigating official counted up to 138 suspicious deaths, basically all of which could likely be attributed to Daria. In the end, she was found guilty of 38 of these crimes, but the Empress wasn't quite sure what the punishment should be, as the death penalty had already been abolished in Russia. In the end, Daria was chained on a public platform and made to wear a sign around her neck that detailed the crimes she committed. After this form of punishment, she was sent to jail to serve out her life sentence. In our number six spot today, we have Herda Oberhauser. Herta was a German physician and convicted war criminal who performed absolutely horrific medical atrocities on prisoners at Ravensbrück Women's Concentration Camp. She was known for being a part of medical experiments like treating purposely infected wounds with sulfonamide as well as bone, muscle, and nerve regeneration and transplantation. Herta was the only female that was a defendant in the Nuremberg doctor trials and she was convicted for crimes against humanity but was only sentenced to 20 years in prison. She was released early for good behavior and ended up becoming a family doctor again in West Germany. That was, however, until a survivor recognized her. Herda then had her medical license revoked and then she was fined. She tried to appeal but was rejected and never practiced medicine again. I think we can all probably be grateful for that. In our number five spot today, we have Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth was a Hungarian noblewoman who lived from August of 1560 to August of 1614. While she was born into one of the oldest and most powerful families in Transylvania and was well-educated and successful, she also was killing young women and bathing in their blood. 
Okay, bury the lead on that one. Sorry about that. Elizabeth has gone down as one of the most evil women in history because she was taking the lives of women who were her servants and she was bathing in their blood because she believed it would keep her young. There's something that's telling me that it probably didn't work. Anyway, instead of being remembered as youthful and beautiful, Elizabeth is instead remembered as being a terrible evil person who took the lives of somewhere from 175 to 200 women, but some accounts swear the number might be as high as 600. In our number four spot today, we have Charles Cullen. This guy used to be a nurse who took the lives of his patients throughout his career, and he may be one of the worst serial killers ever recorded. He confessed to taking the lives of 40 people, but through subsequent interviews, it became apparent that the number was way higher than 40, he just couldn't remember the names of them all. But he could, of course, remember the details of his crimes against them. His crimes started in 1988 and spanned over a decade into 2003. In October of 2003, when a patient at a hospital passed away from low blood sugar, the authorities were called. This person was Charles' final victim, and authorities began looking into him and investigating his past employment history. On December 12, 2003, authorities were arresting him and charging him with only one count of his crimes, but he ended up admitting to 40. He ended up pleading guilty to his crimes and arranged a plea deal where authorities would not seek the death penalty if he cooperated. During one of his court proceedings, he continuously asked the judge to step down and apparently repeatedly chanted, quote, your honor, you need to step down for 25 minutes straight, even after he was restrained and gagged for his outbursts. It is thought that his victims might be up in the 400 range, which is truly unbelievable. Charles was sentenced to 18 consecutive life sentences and will be eligible for parole in 2403. In our number three spot today, we have Charles Manson. While there are a ton of evil people on this list today, Charles is likely one of the most famous for the absolute worst reasons. Manson was released from prison in 1967, where he then moved to San Francisco, and that's where he gained a small following that would eventually go on to be the cult known as The Family. The group eventually moved to an abandoned ranch outside of Los Angeles, and it was here that Manson continued to brainwash his followers and manipulate them with his own religious philosophies. Manson claimed that there would be an upcoming race war in which white people would be killed, which was intended to instill fear in his followers. This was so that he could ignite a race war and send his followers on a killing spree, which did end up being the night of the horrible Tate and LaBianca killings. This led to a reign of terror in the Los Angeles area for several months because people just couldn't understand how or why this happened. In our number two spot today, we have Randy Kraft. Also known as the Scorecard Killer, Randy is a monster who took the lives of at least 16 young men between 1972 and 1983. The Scorecard nickname comes from how, after his arrest, police found a coded list that contained cryptic references to his crimes and the victims. On May 14, 1983, two California Highway Patrol officers observed a car driving erratically and suspected the driver may be impaired, so they pulled it over. Once the car pulled over, Randy Kraft got out and identified himself and subsequently failed all field sobriety tests. At the same time, the other officer went over to the passenger's side where he sadly found Randy's final victim, 25-year-old Marine Terry Lee Gambrel. The next two days of investigation revealed the horrors of what Kraft had done, and on May 16, 1983, he was formally charged with the one crime, but many more charges came in the next months. His trial first began on September 26, 1988, and on August 11, 1989, the jury rendered a verdict of death, and the sentence was upheld. As of this year, he still remains on death row at San Quentin State Prison, where he continues to deny any responsibility for the crimes like they didn't find one of the victims in the passenger seat of his car. In our number one spot today, we have Peter Tobin. Peter Tobin is a serial killer who was convicted for three separate crimes, but it is believed his crimes may actually be up in the range of 40 to 50. Before being convicted of these crimes, Peter also served another 10-year prison sentence for other crimes committed, and he was released from prison for those crimes in 2004. Three years later, however, he was sentenced to life with a minimum of 21 
21 years for taking the life of Angelica Kluke in 2006. After this, remains of two more people who went missing in 1991 were found in his former home, and he was also tried for these crimes, which ended up solidifying his sentence to a whole life order, which means he will never be up for parole. There are some who believe Tobin is responsible for more unsolved crimes, and he has been labeled a psychopath by a senior psychologist. Apparently, while in prison, he has boasted about taking the lives of 48 people, despite the fact that he's only officially been linked to three. So hopefully at some point we'll be able to actually confirm those other crimes that he's been talking about. Number 10, the eyeball man. Can anyone honestly say they aren't scared of this guy? The dude blacked out his eyeball, so he looked like a demonic Jack Skellington. More like Hack Skellington. Eyeball man's real name is Jason Barnum and is currently living out a 22 year sentence for shooting an Alaska police officer. Barnum's crime was heavily influenced by a hefty addiction to chasing the dragon. Three officers were investigating vehicle break ins and burglaries in South Anchorage and spotted a vehicle related to the attacks in a hotel parking lot. They checked out the security footage and saw a man carrying a tote to room 209. Barnum and two others were in the room and when officers entered the bathroom, the shootout began. Barnum was injured in the arm but they arrested him when he got out of the hospital and they had to deal with how terrifying he looks even though he's behind bars. So, yeah. Number 8, Robert P. Hansen. The man the FBI was afraid of and he was right under their noses, joining them for lunch in the cafe, grabbing coffee with them, laughing at the cooler. But all the while, Robert P. Hansen was a mole. On February 18th, 2001, Robert was arrested and charged with committing espionage on behalf of intelligence services for the former Soviet Union and their successors. He was caught red handed placing a package containing highly classified information at a park in Vienna, Virginia for his Russian handlers. When the FBI searched his apartment, it became apparent his payment was in cash and diamonds with the value of over $600,000. Hansen handed over dozens of delicate files, including FBI counterintelligence investigative techniques, sources, methods, operations. He exposed the FBI's secret investigation of Felix Block, a foreign service officer for espionage. He pled guilty to 15 accounts of espionage on July 6, 2001 and was sentenced to prison without the possibility of parole. He is considered the most dangerous spy in FBI history. God knows what he said. Number 7, David Carpenter. I know Lisa Rena from Dancing with the Stars because I love a good foxtrot. Love it. But she's actually more well known for being a desperate housewife. But it turns out that her very own mother was actually David Carpenter's first victim. She knew him from work and he offered to give her a ride home and he had kids and a wife. Soon he was on top of her, hammer and knife in hand, but thankfully a cop was nearby who suspected something was amiss, so she was saved. David was sentenced to 14 years in prison where he was diagnosed as a sociopath with a very high IQ. He was released after only 9 years and quickly went on to commit more attacks against women. Good call on releasing him. Just saying? Like what? Ugh. I hate that. I hate that. At one time, he was even suspected of being the Zodiac Killer. Instead, he became known as the trailside killer who would prey on women on hiking trails. He took the lives of 10 people, though it's probable that there were more. Just two survived, and officers described that he was a kind of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of behavior. He was super nice, but then he had this insane, psycho, creepy, dark side as well. Number six, Zacharias Musawi. The ADX prison is intended as a holding cell to teach prisoners proper conduct before they are sent to penitentiaries. However, some are so bad that they are never released for fear they might inspire new crimes if allowed to communicate to those outside the walls. Zacharias is one of them. He is currently serving out six life sentences for assisting the hijackers who carry Carried out the, you guessed it, the 9 11 attacks on the World Trade Center. Musawi was placed on a watch list in 1999 when he started interacting with Islamist extremists. He could have prevented the attacks entirely, however, he lied to the FBI about the Al Qaeda and their plans to attack the US. He was even supposed to pilot a plane into the White House. He was arrested in August 2001 and went on trial in 2006. Throughout the trial, he praised the Al Qaeda and was removed for several outbursts. A very different tone to the note he wrote recently in 2020 renouncing Al Qaeda and appealed to younger. Muslims to be wary of their deceptive ways. I really do hope he has genuinely released those ideals, however he did do it in an attempt to relax his sentence. As recently as 2018 he was still referring to himself as a natural born terrorist, so needless to say I don't see things relaxing anytime soon. Number 3, Larry Hoover. This dude is so powerful that he was continuing to run his operation while serving out a 200 year sentence for murder. Larry Hoover was, slash is I suppose, the chairman of the notorious gangster 
Caesar Disciples Gang. He was convicted two decades ago of continuing to run his empire behind bars. Hoover, now 70, is serving out six life sentences at the Supermax Federal Prison in Florence, Colorado, a facility that holds the worst of the worst terrorists, mobsters, anyone who'd be a danger to anyone from the outside. It is said to be the most secure in the country. He established the gang in Chicago in the 1960s and has recently decided to try and take some of them down. The indictment accused seven state and national leaders of the gangster disciples of racketeering conspiracy, drug trafficking, witness intimidation, and multiple murders, including the 2018 death of a 65 year old ranking member of the gang on Chicago's south side. Beware if you've ever crossed Larry Hoover, because even behind bars, you can't stop him. Number two, James Marcello. I honestly sound like I'm in a 1940s film noir when I was researching this. You'll see why in a second. He is the highest ranking Chicago mob boss in prison, also known as Jimmy the Man Marcello. Now at the age of 76, he filed a petition in June 2020 to have his sentence tossed out. Jimmy was one of five top criminals who were convicted of the 2007 Family Secrets racketeering case. He was convicted of taking the lives of Tony the Ants, Belotro, and his brother Michael. They were found in in a cornfield in June 1986 after being beaten and strangled to death in Jimmy's basement. He was sentenced to life in prison in 2009 and currently resides at the Supermax facility in Colorado just like Mr. Hoover. Marcelo's father was also in the biz and so was his big brother, Big Mickey. The family had influence. There were crimes that hit the news and crimes no one knows about. Either way, now Jimmy wants out. He's like, ah, come on, give an old guy a break. Not for you, Jimmy. Not for you. Starting off this countdown, we have Nikolai Zumagaliev. This guy is so evil that it's hard to believe what he did was real. So Nikolai is a Soviet serial killer who took the lives of at least 10 people in the 1980s. He would target women and would often axe them to death, after in which he would eat them. In fact, he was given the name Metal Fang because he had false teeth made from white metal. That way, it was easier for him to be able to eat into the flesh. In the late 1980s, he was caught after having one of his friends over, and the friend found a human head and intestines inside of his fridge. After that, he was arrested and tried but declared insane. In 1989, when he was transported to another facility, Nikolai actually escaped and was on the run for two years. Thankfully, he was caught and re-institutionalized. But in December of 2016, he escaped again. But officials refused to confirm the claim. Either way, be careful around this guy, like he might try and escape for the third time. Moving on to number 9, we have Alan Legere. Alan Legere is a Canadian serial killer who on June 21st of 1986 entered a convenience store in Black River Bridge, New Brunswick with two other accomplices and robbed the joint. While doing so, they beat the store owner to death, but they were later caught and arrested. He was given a life sentence and sent to prison. However, in 1989, he managed to escape and was on the run for seven months. During this time, he killed four more innocent people. He also committed arson and a list of other crimes as well. Eventually, he was recaptured and is now spending the rest of his life in Canada's Maximum Security Special Handling Unit. Moving on to number eight, we have Rodney Halbauer. Ever since Rodney was young, he has been committing crimes. It started when he was only 16 years old. During his younger years, he was arrested and released on parole a number of times. But when released, he would commit more crimes, like theft. In 1975, Rodney was released on bail after taking advantage of a lost Vegas blackjack dealer. But while on bail, he took advantage of and killed six other women and received a life sentence. However, in 1977, he actually escaped jail and kidnapped his own daughter. Shortly after, he was recaptured only to escape again in 1986. While on the run, he stabbed and injured another woman. Thankfully, once again, he was recaptured. Wouldn't you think after the first time they would keep a closer eye on him? I guess not. In our seventh spot, we have Thomas Silverstein. Now this dude is said to be one of the most dangerous prisoners of all time and the most violent prisoner in America. He was first jailed in 1978 for armed robbery. While in jail, he killed a prison officer and two inmates. He also was the leader for the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang for quite some time. This prison gang is the largest and deadliest prison gang in the US with an estimated 20,000 members inside the prison and on the streets. Because of how many people he killed and injured in prison, 
Silverstein got transferred to a federal prison in Atlanta. There, he was confined in a six by seven foot cell. He was under 24 hour surveillance. In fact, the lights in his cell were never turned off so that they could always watch him. Silverstein eventually died in prison at the age of 67. In our sixth spot today, we have Victor Figueroa. On February 6, 1997, Victor Figueroa managed to escape a Moroa shock incarceration facility in Mineville, New York. Victor had been serving a one to four year sentence for drug possession, but decided to take his chances and flee. When authorities noticed that he was missing, they searched the area, but all the leads ran cold. He has not been seen or heard from since. In fact, he's the only New York state prison inmate to escape and never be found. Either he's still out there or he died while trying to escape. Either way, it's a bit scary thinking that he could potentially still be out there. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with James Eddie Diggs. To the public, James Eddie Diggs seemed like a top-notch citizen. He seemed to be a great family man with a happy wife and two young sons. However, in the morning of May 26, 1949, he shot and killed his wife and kids before disappearing forever. Police did manage to find him a week later, but he managed to escape the officer by shooting him in the face and killing him. He since fled into the woods and hasn't been caught since. In fact, he was one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives for the longest time, but he was eventually removed from the list in 1961 and is said to be dead by now. In our fourth spot, we have Robert Maudsley. Robert Maudsley is considered Britain's most dangerous prisoner, and you're about to find out why. In 1974, Maudsley was arrested for taking advantage of young individuals, but during his trial, he was found unfit and was sent to Broadmoor Hospital instead of a prison. While there, Maudsley and another patient locked themselves in a cell with another patient and held him hostage. While there, they tortured him to death over a period of nine hours. After this incident, he was convicted of manslaughter and was sent to Wakefield Prison. And there, he killed three inmates, after which he got placed in solitary confinement and spends his life in a glass cell underneath Wakefield Jail. In our third spot, we have George Edward Wright. In 1962, George Edward Wright was convicted for murder and was sentenced to up to 30 years in prison. Wright and three other men went on a spree of armed robbery, one in which they shot a man and took off with his money, which was only $70, so was it really worth it? Anyways, they were caught and put into jail. But then in 1970, Wright managed to escape from a prison in New Jersey. He was caught and locked up once again, only to escape once more in 1972. This time, he made sure he was never going to be caught again. So he came up with a plan. This plan involved hijacking a Delta Airlines flight and collecting ransom for the release of the passengers. Upon doing so, they flew the plane to Portugal. In 2011, the police caught up with him in Portugal, but since Portugal has no extradition treaty with the United States, Wright was released. He remains a fugitive to this day. Coming in at number two, we have Eric Rudolph. In 1996, Eric Rudolph bombed Atlanta's Centennial Olympic Park during the Summer Games. As a result, two individuals were killed and over 100 were injured. But that was just the beginning of his deadly bombing spree. He pulled off three more bombings, injuring hundreds more. For five years, the police were on a hunt for Eric. At one point, he was one of the top 10 fugitives on the FBI's list. It wasn't until 2003 that Eric got arrested. Turns out that he was hiding in the mountains for five years. Being a skilled outdoorsman, this helped him greatly. When he was caught, he pled guilty to all four bombings and was given four life sentences without the possibility of parole. He's now spending the rest of his life in the super prison in Florence, Colorado. And in our number one spot today, we have Santiago Maduros. In 2010, Santiago fired into a random person's car because one of the passengers was wearing the wrong color jacket. The victim had no ties to any gang. He was just an innocent person riding in his sister's car. He was severely injured and his sister was unfortunately killed. A couple weeks later, Santiago and some of his friends were robbing a car. And when a group of men tried to stop them, he shot at them as well. He killed a random person that was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. From there, he was on the run for about a decade. He was finally caught in 2020 in Mexico. Mm -hmm. 